The Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace Feel free to have a seat. So grace, peace, and life are ours thanks to the one we seek. The one that we seek to follow and embrace the very bread of life as we have heard these past weeks, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Yikes. Don't take this out of context, am I right? If you were not a follower of Jesus and somebody said, you know, you need to read the good word, you need to read the word of Jesus, and you flipped open the Bible and said, hey, like here is probably a good news passage, and your friend, who's not a believer, read that out loud, Would you not cringe? Do not take it out of context. I've sat with this text all week. I had a whole sermon written out on Tuesday, and I had to rewrite it. I just was like, I'd go somewhere, start like unpacking it, and I'm like, nope, still not. I just felt like I was going to give you a 10-hour sermon and never actually land anywhere. So don't take it out of context, and yet here it is in black and white along with, thankfully, the helpful text from Proverbs and Ephesians. Those two lessons, praise be to God, bring a helpful lens for today. And the lens that they bring are the lens, is the lens of wis- wisdom. So wisdom. We hear that wisdom is lauded in our first reading from Proverbs. Wisdom, did you know, and I'm going to invite you to look at the front of your bulletin, is one of TLC's core five core, five core values. And um, we have really focused on that, and I, and I want to continue to lift that up so that we live into our strengths and gifts as a church um, and find out how those values line up with things like Bible study, prayer, and discipleship. And I did a little bit of work on that in, in uh, teaching confirmation to our last class of confirmands. And when we uh, had the day on wisdom, which was also partnered with um, Bible study, I invited someone from the congregation to come and share on wisdom. Who do you think I maybe invited? If you were going to invite someone from the congregation about wisdom, who would you invite? Senior member, okay. Any other different answers? That's kind of what I was expecting, and that's where my heart goes. And I think if you're going to seek out somebody that has wisdom um, or that you're going to expect wisdom from, when the longer we live on the earth, the more experiences we have, we pray, right, that we grow in wisdom. Well, the person that I invited for the youth was Julia Blanchard. Julia Blanchard is one of our more recent celebrated graduates who will be heading off to college this week. So she's not the youngest among us, she's not the oldest among us, and yet she did share wisdom from her very lips with that group. I'll get back to that later. Wisdom. Many think, as I just said, that wisdom is defined by um, and shaped by facts and knowledge, by coming to a conclusion on what is right. But we can get into the weeds when we stay too long, when we demand too much of questions, particularly the questions of how. We hear the Judeans say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? A difficult question, 
definitely one that we could spend a long time in asking how. And it's in black and white, so we're invited to not look away, but to lean in. So I'm led to follow this good news thread today for us today. It's coming from uh, blogger D. Mark Davis, and he says this. In regards to this passage, he says, I want to feel that there is some kind of mystical and deep meaning in these verses. And he goes on to say, though, that once the sides of the debate have been marked out, the debate has lost its power of depth and devolves into a question of which option is right rather than how might we speak? How might we speak of such a thing? So let's follow the good news of this question. How might we speak of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood? And I think the first wisdom that we can take is that we shouldn't deny what it says. It is shocking, it is gruesome, it is alarming. And I think that even in Jesus' day, he meant it to be this way because it gets attention. God wants us to pay attention to what God is doing. And if you recall, this is our third Sunday, our fourth Sunday in bread, but our third Sunday of eat this bread. How? What? And the Judeans are the ones that are being really tenacious about it. And so he goes another level. They keep asking for a different level. He goes to a different level and gets their attention and alerts to what God is doing. God is doing something new. What we also need to remember is that this is written for a community. Remember that the, the stories of the gospel are written particularly to meet the needs of a community that is figuring out how to follow Jesus. And this community is kind of drawing lines in the sand of where you are. Are you someone that follows Jesus and used to be a Jew? Are you a Gentile who's trying to follow Jesus? They were trying to figure things out. So what we can hear from this is don't deny what it says and to be reminded that being a person of faith means staying with the hard things staying with the hard things, but also, and also realizing where we have gone wrong as the people of faith over the years. We do quarrel about what, this, what these words mean. Not only that, we have killed people over trying to figure out how to say this properly, how to say it enough, far enough, and, and very often, if we get too much, like I said, in the weeds on what is right and what is wrong, we can otherize people. So we had this quarrel. What words mean what we're talking about? The words like transubstantiation, consubstantiation, spiritual presence, symbolic meaning. It's been ages and ages and ages of trying to figure this out. So don't deny it. Stay with the hard things. And that even means staying with the hard things that happen in life. Hunger, abuse, power, politics. We need to stay with politics, and we need to be able to stay with politics in conversation as followers of Jesus, because remember, as we heard a few weeks ago, politics can be the negotiating of life together, right? And if we're focused on right and wrong, as opposed to how are we doing this in life together, then we can go awry and lose the wisdom and the support and the good news that is in the midst of us. Because we need to ask and answer questions like, does all mean all? How do we love God and love neighbor? And do we need to be right? Or do we need to explore how we might speak of such things? So don't deny the hard things. Stay in conversation with each other. How might we talk about such things? Praise be to God that God starts with us where we are, but doesn't leave us there. God stretches us. How often am I grateful that I can stand up here and talk of, about the stuff of life? Vines, right? Our plant that lives out there now and continues to grow and thrive. Bread, we're talking about it for one more week after today. God gives us great images and analogies a way for us to start to begin to be able to get our brains around the intangible so that they can be tangible enough. So God starts with where we are and stretches us. 
And there is some helpful wisdom, some helpful things that I can unpack for us today. So today you get a Greek lesson because it's really, really helpful. So throughout the entirety of John 6, we're talking about eating, right? Eating bread. Uh, Today we also get uh, some conversation uh, about drinking. Now within our particular verses for today, we get the word eat in six out of the seven verses. And it always shows up as eat. If, you go, if we went back and look, but there are different Greek words that are being used that were not nuanced by those that did the translating. So across the whole of John 6, where, where we've been um, for the last couple weeks, we get the Greek word phago. Can you say phago? And you want to think of pop, but no. Think we're in another state and they don't know what, what phago is. Not phago pop, but phago, the Greek word uh, for eat. And this Greek word of eating means to devour, to consume. You know, basically you take it in, you're really, really hungry, you burn it up, and you're going to need it again. So it's something that is consumed, like rust consumes metal. It just eats it up until it's gone. So for most of John 6, This is the Greek word for eat that we get, to consume, to devour. Well, the interesting thing is in this section, in John 6 from 51 to 58, Jesus switches to the Greek word trogo. Can you say trogo? Trogo means to gnaw or to munch, as in a more focused, time-consuming ritual, basically, Small bites, small bits. So we go from devour to gnaw, to stay with, to chew on. So this verb of eat, going from phago to trogo, invites us to remain, to consider. That God starts with the things that we know, bread. We eat bread, we eat food when we're hungry and we want to devour it. And yet, Jesus invites us to enjoy the meal, to come to the table, to chew, to take our time. Ver- the verb of eat reminds us to, reminds us, invites us to remain and consider. And the wisdom that we can take out of that is that the life in Christ is so far beyond us that we, beyond what we can see and know that language fails. So these analogies that God gives us, these connections to the ordinary that God gives us are great. And we have to know that they're going to run their course and that language is going to fail us and yet language is still what we have. So don't look away. Know that God starts with us and stretches us. And the final piece of the puzzle today for good news is that we as people of faith, We that follow Jesus through a Lutheran practice are people who embrace mystery. So here is where I invite you to find uh, your red hymnal and to open it up and go to the back and find that the small catechism lives there and you want to turn to page 1166. And it is in good Jesus fashion and in good Lutheran fashion to ask this question, how might we speak of such things? And today we have three particular invitations to consider. Martin Luther also considered this question as he sought to follow Jesus. And so his first question is, what is the sacrament? And he tells us it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself. Christ, in our John 6 lesson for today, does refer to himself as true, the true life offered. And so here, it's offered and affirmed that this is a true expression of Jesus, but are you still really feeling like it's not nailed down? So what we can take from this openly is that true is good, that it's biblical. It lines up with what Jesus said, God is good. But what does true mean? What do still some of all of those words mean? We run out of language for this. 
So it's true. That's what we can take away from this first invitation of how. It is true. But how is it true? Then we can jump to one, two, three, four. How can bodily eating and drinking do such a great thing, it says. And he shares there that it's not the eating or drinking per se, but it is the words. The words recorded and shared. Those words of given for you, shed for you. So saying that the intake and the words are the essential thing. Jesus is true. This is an essential thing for us to do along with whoever believes, whoever trusts has forgiveness. This is the base. This is the foundation. Christ is present in the midst of the words and the elements. And yet, if we sit with it, it still doesn't quite unpack it all the way. So why? Why the words and the elements? Jesus is true. Amen. We do this thing, but why? Why do we do this thing? then what is the benefit of eating? Forgiveness. It's eating and drinking with a purpose. Christ's living, Christ's love, and Christ's life are given and received for a purpose. So again, it's straightforward. We've got Christ is the true presence. We do it and uh, have it between um, the elements and the word, and we do it for forgiveness. Doesn't that put it in a nutshell for you? Doesn't that answer all of the questions? (laughs) No. We are a people that embraces mystery. So the closest that we can really get at, Jesus, what do you mean, is that Jesus is in, with, and under. Say that for me. In, with, and under. Jesus is in, with, and under everything that we do, and particularly at this table. That is the closest that we really feel we can honestly, truly embrace how Christ is present. It is okay to say that what happens at this table, what happened at the cross, what happened at the open tomb is a miracle and a mystery. Because God is bigger than us. And life in Christ is so far beyond what we can see and know that language fails. So again, considering, gnawing, chewing, sitting with. Yes, it's not 100% devoured, nailed down, understood, airtight. We need and invited, I think, are to be more comfortable as followers of Jesus with saying, you're right, I don't know. You're right, I don't know. This is a really awful passage. But come along. Come with me. Don't turn away. Wisdom, as we've heard over the weeks, is to ask. The first week we heard, give us this bread. Each and every Sunday or any time we gather to pray, we can say, give us this, our daily bread. We can ask and be drawn, be reminded that none of us come to this unless we're drawn by the Father. And today, our wisdom is to openly consider That as we consider, as we ask the questions, as we believe, as we trust, prayerfully that one of us will say, yep, I think we've reached the end of this one for today. We need to say that's what we've discussed, and now we need to have open hands, open minds, and open hearts. And praise be to God that there's still one more piece. We still get one more piece next week. And we get a glimpse of it in the language from uh, Verse 56, abide in me. Jesus says to abide in me. So wisdom. That wisdom that Julia shared all those months ago was that it's good to come together to inquire and to learn, to read the Bible and to discuss with others. Essentially what I heard her say is it's good to have partners. It's good to have partners in faith. We are partners in faith. When we show up, we're getting to be a partner for someone else. Martin Luther in the small catechism is not also a good partner. So that's why I want you to know that if I'm not hitting the mark on preaching for you, I invite you then to go to the back of the book because actually this sermon grew out of someone saying, I think I need a, a primer on communion. 
So thank you, Katie Dyer. <laughs> you were the Holy Spirit to me this week. We are not going to figure out the perfect way to talk about this, and we need to keep talking about it, and we need to know who our good partners are. So thank you, Julia, for your wisdom. We need to be able to explore the hows without, not, without necessarily arriving in an absolute right. Because the good news for today is God is God, and we're not. God is God, and we're not. So wisdom. What wisdom can we take forth from this place? Praise be to God that we get it in Ephesians. Be careful then how you live your life. Be filled with the Spirit. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make melody to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks to the God the Father at all times and for everything, even the hard things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today's wisdom is to embrace the miracle and the mystery, being drawn by God, seeking to catch and sometimes limitedly describe the infinite and the indescribable for the moment, and experiencing save and love in action together. At the table, through the word made flesh, as people that are forgiven and sent, as the hands, the feet, the heart, the body of Christ, into a world that needs more grace and space than rightness and rigidness. Would you agree with me the world could use some grace and some space? Receive it fully this day at this table. You are forgiven. And then we are sent into a world that needs that love. Amen.